Hey, good Thursday morning, everybody. Welcome to the Vault Quest Mailbag Podcast. I'm Eric Kane with Grant Ramey, Brent Hubbs, and Austin Price. This podcast is presented, as always, by our friends at Exterior Home Solutions. For a free estimate, you can give them a call today at 865-524-5888 or visit them online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. Local and trusted since 1999, that is Exterior Home Solutions. We got a lot of questions to get into today. We're going to hit the basketball ones first so we can let Grant Ramey go off and, and do his job. We will start with Smokey Man 15. Uh, kind of open ended, and, and we should all kind of jump in on this one, but we'll start with Grant. Favorite Dalton Connect memory? And then he puts in parentheses, hopefully yet to be seen. Uh, the stretch against Auburn in the second half, the 25 points in 10 minutes when Tennessee was down eight and looked like they're going to lose that basketball game. And the way he took over. Uh, not just that he scored 25 and 10, but the way Auburn was trying to defend him. At one point, they had three guys out there when he was basically in front of the Tennessee bench. That's how far away he was from the bucket. Uh, there were a couple possessions where Janai Broom wanted to switch onto Dalton, and Broom put his hand in his face, and Dalton shot a 30-footer over him with his hand in his face. And then the next possession, he drove and had that two-hand dunk where he kind of swung on the rim a little bit. And Auburn was just kind of standing around looking like, what are we supposed to do to stop this dude? That was the most... Like, he's done a lot of insane stuff. He's had a lot of insane spurts, but that's the most insane thing I've seen in person. Yeah, I mean, how do you not how do you not go with that one? Because I think that was the, the highlight. For for me, I, I, a second to that would be what he did in Athens, Georgia, uh, because th- that win there – I mean, Tennessee was in deep, deep trouble on the road. You don't want to go 0-2 to start league play. Um, and to me, that was a signature moment for him. Yeah, he put a bunch of points up against Mississippi State, but that was a savior bacon deal, and that was kind of the first savior bacon where I went, all right, this guy's built different, okay? And, and listen, what he did in Chapel Hill was crazy and all that, but but to win that game and will them kind of to the win in Athens, Georgia, to – I mean, think about it. You blow that when you don't win the regular season. Um, you might not get a double buy if you lose that game in, in the second SEC game of the year. That's how this league's been. So that would be a, a number two for me. But Auburn clearly would be my number one just because of insane. AP, I think you're in the house for the Auburn one low, lower level, right, and, t- and took in that game? Uh, no, I wasn't. There. Oh, you missed that one. Okay. I, I, can't, I can't remember from all your Instagram po- photos. A- AP was courtside for Florida. That was another good one. Yeah, they put on the show there too. He the did. game you're know. thinking of, he was he was sitting on the floor at the Memphis Grizzlies game. Well, I know he was there for that one too. I mean, <laughs> he's 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 a high roller on the basketball court. But go ahead, AP. Your your favorite Dalton Connect memory. Uh, I mean, I, I just think just honestly, I think it's the collaboration of everything that he's brought to every fan of Tennessee basketball. I mean, how many fans have kind of got sucked in by Dalton Connect this year? How many young fans? How many young Tennessee fans have kind of been like, wow, this is like our version of Michael Jordan or LeBron James at the Tennessee level. Um, because the way he plays, he plays different than Grant. Grant was awesome, two-time SEC player of the year. But Dalton can bring the floor up. He could literally take the game over by just, you know, basically ISOing out. Um, yeah, I, I just thought at that moment he was spectacular. Um, you know, all year long. And doing so, sometimes even without the basketball in his hands. So, um, you know, for me, you know, I think as the poster pointed out, you hope that the best is yet to come. I, I think, you know, Dalton's got to be Dalton, though. Like, I don't think you can – like, anytime Dalton has forced – like, when he's trying to get 40 a few times and, he, and he's forcing things, that never goes well. When he just kind of lets it come to him and just kind of just, just plays, that's when he's at his best. And, and you hope that there's some guys around him that can make some shots come Thursday and Saturday and on down the line. Yeah, you can certainly pick your poison on which game you want to go with or which stretch you want to go with. I, you know, I, I think the first thing that jumped out of my mind when I read the question was, and it was, it was in a game that didn't count, but it was that exhibition at Michigan State, just because we were introduced to this guy, and it's like, oh, well, you, you know, for the common fan, I mean, for those not following the program or around in summer workouts and everything, we we knew who Dalton Connect was, but you, know, you saw him go out there and do what he did, scoring twenty eight at Michigan State, and you're like. Wow, th- th- this could be a fun little ride here, and, and it certainly has been. I think a lot of people that night thought, okay, but is this another Tyreek Key from a year yeah. ago down in Texas? You know what I mean? Like right. Tyreek Key went bananas down in Texas. And, and Well, but remember remember this, Grant. I mean, you, you've talked to Rod Clark for the story. You've talked to Rick Barnes about Dalton Connect. I mean, 
that was the game for them that changed, okay, what do we have in this guy? Because he he had been good in practice and made shots, but he hadn't played with that kind of intensity and hadn't played at that level um, until they got to the Michigan State game. I mean, Rick Barnes has said right. that's, that's where it's like, okay, he's different, right? So that was, and, the, and that get, was the game for them. And get ready to roll your eyes, Tennessee fans, but Rick Barnes said he was different because of how much effort he put in on the defensive end, and he just hadn't seen <laughs> that at that point. Uh, through the summer. So that was the difference for him. It wasn't the shot making. It wasn't the transition behind the back, huge dunk over Malik Hall. It was how much defensive effort he put in. But I agree with Eric. It, it, it's more than just the dunk for me too. It's the 28 points and the shot making that he kind of put on display there that you kind of started to get a, a little bit of a hint that this guy, like Hub said, might be different. Yeah. My uh, my, my second option would be uh, what he did against Carolina just because, you know, nostalgia. Sure. I mean, I know Carolina's a, obviously a good basketball team this year, but you know, it's against Carolina and, and you know, on that right. stage and, and all that. But he's certainly had a couple of good ones. Uh, we'll go to Pine. Than, Which favors – say what? He's had a lot more than a couple. I mean, oh, yeah? his, his answers in the South Carolina game to win the SEC regular season title. I mean, every time Carolina, South Carolina made a play, he had an answer on the other end of the court. I mean, he didn't score 40 in that game. But man, his buckets to, to stymie their runs down there was was terrific. I mean, he's had a it's just been unbelievable to watch. Hopefully it's it's got still got a lot of legs left in it for Tennessee. It's six games of thirty five points or more, is that right, Grant? Yes, that's correct. It's incredible. Um, let's go to Pine. Which favors the Vols basketball in the tournament more? Playing a team they've already played so they don't have to have a quick scout, or playing someone new that has not seen the Tennessee defensive grant? Um, probably, oh gosh, I guess the only repeat you're talking about is what South Carolina, maybe in the sweet 16, if South Carolina gets past Oregon and Creighton and Tennessee gets past Texas, and Colorado state. I mean, or, Texas, there's go ahead. You know, I was gonna say, or, or way down the line. Yeah. Kansas you know. Purdue and the elite eight. Yeah. And, and Texas is a little bit different because there's some familiarity there with the past couple of years. Uh, they got obviously some, some different personnel, but there's some guys on there, Dylan Mitchell and, and some others that have been there and, and faced Tennessee the last couple of seasons uh, in the big 12 SEC challenge before that went away. But um, I, I don't know. South Carolina is tough, but if you get there and, and get that part three, I think you prove something in Columbia in terms of what you could do there. Creighton's going to be a tough game to win if you get there and, and Creighton gets there. Cause they got three guys that average 17. They got one of the best big men in the country. They've got good guards that can score it. That's usually bad news for Tennessee, but um, I think you could go either way. I think in this time of year, you can you can look on either side of it and, and paint <laughs> paint a nightmare some scenario if you want to. Um, but I think Creighton would be the tougher matchup. Well, and remember this too. I mean that that would not be a quick scout, right? I mean, right. If, if that you, would be a few days in advance. You, yeah, you got advanced to work on that one because you're not turning that for you know 24 hours later or 48 right. hours later to play. So. There, there's no real quick advantage to, to, to a quick turnaround for that game. Right. Sam Smith's got a couple of questions, but we'll hit his basketball one here. In your basketball expert opinion, what's the one guy in Tennessee's pod that scares you and which team is the worst matchup? Uh, I think the collection of some of the Texas names scares you more than maybe what they've done uh, because – Dylan D'Souza, a name that Tennessee fans know from Vanderbilt. He's been productive in the past. Mac, Max Abemus was the guy at Oral Roberts last year that was scoring a million points, and he was going to be the biggest name in the portal, and he lands at Texas. Dylan Mitchell was a five-star guy that Tennessee went really hard after, and I think he picked Texas over Tennessee. He hasn't really panned out to that five-star potential, but when you have that collection of talent, Tyrese Hunter was a guy at freshman of the year at Iowa State a couple years ago, the point guard. He ended up at Texas. So I think it's the collection of talent at Texas that – uh, if they figure it out, I think they went 99 over their last 18 in the regular season. But if they figure it out for 40 minutes, that could be a problem. Uh, Colorado State, you would have the size advantage. Uh, I don't know if they have anybody over 6'8", but if you look at what they did to Virginia in the first four, uh, they made, you know, Virginia's not a good basketball team, but they made them look awful. So I think uh, Nico Medvev, the, the head coach at Colorado State, knows what he's doing. So uh, I would probably go with. Texas's collection of talent and and the fear that it would click on that night against Tennessee, opposed to just one guy, maybe. We'll go next to RG underscore one hundred thoughts on six AP voters not including Dalton Connect on their first team All American ballots. He goes on to say, um, you know, kind of compare this to, to baseball and the Baseball Writers Association not voting King Griffey as a first ballot Hall of Famer. I mean, he still was, but there were some writers who didn't and. 
I'm with you there. I cannot stand the Hall of Fame voting for, for Major League Baseball, but that's another conversation. Um, what are your thoughts on, on six AP voters leaving Dalton Connect off their ballot? I mean, it's not a big deal. He's still first team. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be unanimous. Uh, he can still be a consensus first team All-American if the uh, National Association of Basketball Coaches and the U.S. Basketball Writers Association have him first team. Uh, so if he gets four first team nods, he's already got two of them. He's going to be a consensus All-American. I believe he would be the fourth first team consensus All-American, maybe the sixth uh, consensus All-American Tennessee basketball history. So you know, if you do poll tracker and you look at how some of these guys votes through in the AP poll throughout the year, you'll realize it really doesn't matter because some of these people don't have a clue what they're doing based on some of their votes. So your first team, it doesn't matter. It didn't cost you anything. I was going to say, Brent, I mean, like if you have a, a, a an All-American vote and you're not including Dalton Connect on your first team, I mean, are you living under a rock are you, or are you just stupid? Like, that's how I kind of view this. Well, I mean, I just, you know, I, I think some people don't. They just throw something together at the last minute, that, that, you know, right against the deadline, and you know, don't don't research anything, don't look at anything, and you know, maybe you don't watch enough games or don't watch enough highlights. You know, you're, I, I don't put a whole lot of stock in those deals. I mean, I, I've been, you know, I, I've been a, a voter before on that on that kind of stuff, and it's it's hard to do because you don't watch a ton of games and. You know, you don't you don't pay enough attention probably to everything around the country because of your own job, right? I mean, it's it's hard to go back and see some of that stuff all the time. But yeah, I mean, I think it's crazy that that he didn't make somebody you know six guys ballots. But that it doesn't shock me that he didn't make six guys ballots, given what we've seen out of out of you know the voting polls of all all sports over the last decade, decade and a half. Yeah, because you have at the end of the day you have the human element and. You know, did Dalton Connect do something that frustrated the voter? Did Tennessee fans rail on some, you know, voter and he just doesn't yeah. like Tennessee? You know, yeah. I mean, you have the human element to all this stuff. And you got the fact that a lot of these guys, you know, I almost say, like, that's not fair. There are some people that just that just kind of skirt by, you know, with their name, whether that be media guys, that be with coaches um, that have built up a reputation and then kind of start to tail off just because they get older and don't get as motivated. Um, so, I mean, like, I, I would never worry about it. I mean, as long as he's a, if, if he ends up being a unanimous consensus first team All American, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter if collective 14 people didn't vote for him throughout the process. Who cares? Last one for Grant here, and then we'll shift gears and talk more football. This is from Cyclone Vol. What positions will Coach Barnes target in the transfer portal? Any early prospects in the portal to watch for? Of course, we've already seen a you know a, so some movement. A guard from Pepperdine went and committed somewhere a couple of days ago. Uh, so anybody to watch for, and what what positions should Tennessee target? Committed to Alabama, and no, I don't think Tennessee's going to go that route in terms of uh, hitting the portal hard before the season's over. Um, I think there's probably some names out there. Uh, I don't know if there are names that are need to be thrown out there at this point because I don't know how much real traction's there. Um, I think you're going to have to. There's not going to be another Dalton Connect in the portal. There's never going to be another Dalton Connect in the portal, but you do need a score. You do need to find somebody that can score it in the backcourt. Um, point guard would be something that I would be looking at because you're, you're, as soon as the season ends, everybody's going to be looking at Freddie DeLeon and trying to figure out what he's going to do. Zakai's back. You're bringing in Bishop Boswell. I think you need more depth there. Um, I love Jonas Adu. I think he has first team, you know, uh, all SEC, SEC potential. I think Tobey Walk is growing there, but I don't know that J.P. Estrella is ready to take a big step. I don't know that Cade Phillips is ready to take a big step, so you might need a big man, but we'll see what happens there. I think first and foremost, you need a score. Secondly, I'd be looking at guard help. I don't know if Tennessee will view it that way, but I think that's something you need for sure. All right, Tennessee basketball about ready to begin its NCAA tournament journey. Of course, we got coverage, Grant, Rob, and Charlotte, all that at VolQuest.com. And um, have, you, have you slept up and get ready for the late tip-off tomorrow night or tonight? Uh, no, I have not, but trust me, there's, there's more than enough caffeine packed in this suitcase to make it <laughs> before we, right. before, before Grant heads out, Grant, not, not Ziegler, Adu or connect. Give me the one guy that, that, that you think is the X factor key for this, the entire tournament, not just t t tonight's game, the entire deal. Santi, just see a shot go down, man. Just hit a shot early. First four minutes, shoot it in rhythm, quit hesitating on three point line. Keep shooting. I thought you did a better job of that against system. Mississippi state. Speak it into existence. Just hit a shot. It's going to happen at some point. He can go back to being Santi of old and, and hit shots like he always has. Just need to see one go down. All right. We will change gears here, talk a little football. But uh, first, let's get a word in from our friends over at Exterior Home Solutions. 
Severe weather can strike at any time in East Tennessee, and Mother Nature can do severe damage to the first and most important line of defense that you and your family have against Mother Nature, and that is your root. Whenever she strikes, make sure that you call the people that I call. Make sure you trust the people that I trust, and that's my friends at Exterior Home Solutions, because they're more than friends, they're truly family. That phone number for Exterior Home Solution is 865-524-5888. You can go visit them online at ExteriorHomeSolutions.com as well. All right, we get back into your mailbag questions. Let's go to Big Easy Vol. Will Boo Carter have an impact this year, AP? I'm going to say yes. Um, and a lot of times I'm hesitant on freshmen, especially freshmen in the secondary, um, just knowing how Tim Banks likes to play older guys. Um, but... I'm going to say yes here. Boo just kind of continues to make plays dating back to, to you know, bowl practice, um, you know, continues to kind of carry himself a certain way. The staff is talking about him a certain way. Um, I'm going to say yes. So you're saying a defensive impact, not just special teams? Yes. Wow. Okay. I mean, that doesn't mean he's going to play 60 snaps a game, right? It's just he'll have a role, hopefully. And, you know, if that role is – that would mean that your your coaches are going to have to switch in some guys back there, which they've, they've been more willing to do that at the star position over the years than at safety. Well, we can say that. But, I, can, I mean, I, 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 I would this. say yes. Even if he doesn't start, Eric, if I'm Jordan Thomas or somebody that's competing with Boo Carter, better not get injured because I have a feeling if he comes on the field, he's not coming back off. Will Vescovy and James score more than a combined 20 points in the tournament? Put in parentheses, they have to for us to make it past the first weekend. Yeah, I mean, Brent, they, they better, right? I mean, you're talking about a combined 20 points between the two of them amongst a couple of games, uh, you know, six games, you hope, uh, when it's all said and done, I'll say yes. Yeah, I mean, if, they, if, if those two, and if you're making a deep run and those two haven't scored 20 points, then... Uh, I would be surprised. I, now, 20 points in the same game, that's a whole different conversation. I'm not sure that happens. That would be a much better line to set if you're looking for some uh, over-under action is do they score 20 in a game in the tournament? Um, I'm not convinced of that. But 20 points in the tournament total, yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll combine for 20 points in the tournament. All right, what are your initial thoughts on some freshmen after the first couple of days? Which ones look like they can help physically we just talked about boo carter there were some other freshmen that uh you know first couple of days of practice that have jumped out for you well he's not going to play this year but i think jesse perry long term uh has the the size makeup that you're looking for um you know gage genther is a guy that i think you know can help you know again long term as far as helping this year hover um you know, I think both receivers are, are, are going to factor. I'd love to see Peyton Lewis this spring. Obviously, he had to have surgery and is, is out. But, uh, again, he passes the eye test. But uh, there's a few guys that I think could potentially help them, but specifically starting a receiver. Yeah, I mean, I think that you're looking for a skill for a skill guy, um, skill body type is a guy who could come in and make a real impact. Um, I like where I like where you're at with those two offensive linemen too. I mean, I, I think Gage Ginther is going to be a, a good player at Tennessee. I don't think he's going to have to be the guy this year, um, but but I think you like him and and Jesse Perry is prototypical. But he, I mean, he's got miles to go from a pass protection standpoint. Not that he can't get there, but he's got a long ways to to go with that. You know, with the transfer portal too, the the dependency on freshmen is not what it once was. Because if you know you've got a need and you're going to have to, you're going to have a need there. Do you just say, okay, we're going to turn it over to a, a guy who's fresh out of high school, or do we go get help in the portal? Right? You go get help in the portal, and, and that's where it's at, and, and that's why um, you don't, you're not as dependent on some of these guys as you would be. I, I love, I love Staley at wide receiver. I, I really do. I, everything about him in two days, and it's two days of non-contact. Right? It's two days of of a lot of routes versus there. We saw some one-on-one stuff. There's something about that guy, AP, that that I just – I don't know. It, it just he, – he looks like a prototypical slot in this offense. Yeah, he, he's wearing 14. You get the feels of Cedric Wilson. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's the number, right? That's a good point. Because Mike Matthews is in a bad number right now. 
He's an 89. He looks like Steve Smith out there. It's, well, yeah, we were leaving the complex yesterday. I said, I love you in 89. He just grinned at him and he shook his head and he goes, Don't get me started. Why yeah. did Staley get 14 and, and you know, well, Webb and last year they got all those high ones? Staley doesn't want 14, but, you know, that's just a, they hype just literally just, it's just like he throws a, like a bunch of dice out there and he goes, Oh, 89 for <clears> like, you know, 60. No, I get it, but like. Nine. I would rather have 14 than 89 right now. 100 percent thousand percent. If you look back at last year at the the freshman receivers, uh Nimrod, Caleb Webb, all those guys had in the 80s, right? 81, 84. Yeah. They've never have moved off that. I can promise you Mike Matthews is moving off 89. <laughs> Squirrel White used to be um 80 something as well. I was gonna say 80, but that was Romel Keaton. Actually, I think Keaton had switched, but I don't know. But yeah. I, I like Braylon Staley as well, to your point. I think he's looked really good over his first two days. Um, I don't know. We just we just got to see more. It's It's been two days. I want to see what these guys look like in pads. But Staley is the one that's jumped off the off the page for me uh, over the first two days. How piecemeal will the positions be this spring? How much is it going to be just surviving at certain positions right now, like the offensive line, um, because of some injuries and guys being held out right now? Well, AP, I mean, I think you are piecemealing that offensive line because you're not going to put Cooper Mays in, into, a, into a situation where you get him hurt. I think you're going to be very cautious with him there, be be very calculated about when he gets reps. And Vice and Lang needs every rep he can get. Vice and Lang needs to get beat up this spring, right? I mean, not not hurt, but he needs to get beat around this spring. And and, and he needs to – I mean, I he needs to – advocating for violence. No, but, I mean, he, he needs to go against Omari Thomas and Omar Norman Lyon. I mean, he needs to go against those dudes as much as he can go against them, sure. not just for not just for the backup role this fall, but to get himself ready if he's going to be the center in 25 as well. I, I think that he needs – I think he needs to get as much wear and tear as he can take th this spring. You know, with Spragans out, I don't know what I don't know what that guard spot's going to look like when when it's all said and done. But it's going to give some young guys great opportunities. AP, so they're going to be a little bit piecemeal there. Um, that backup offensive line when the twos go out there will be an adventure for sure. Um, but that's what spring practice is all about. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what it looked like on the offensive line. I mean. The, where, the where it will not be it, it will not be piecemeal. AP is on the defensive line because Gosh, they roll their first team out there and they're they're that's that's a good looking group. They roll the second team out there, and that's a good looking group. And then you roll the third team out there, and you go some of those guys are going to be in the rotation to help you because they literally might go fifteen deep on the defensive front. I didn't even mention like Tyree Weathersby in my little notes yesterday. Be, and they that, they were already three deep before I even thought of Tyree Weathersby, and I mean, he's well, out there, but like, well, and, and he's out there, and they're bringing him along slowly. Yeah, the things they're asking him to do, I'm told there's been no drop off post surgery than to what he was doing before the surgery, which is a great sign because I mean he had hip surgery. It's not like you know he had you know, you know something simple, right? Um, yeah. And so uh, the the coaches are very excited about kind of where he's at in the process. Again, taking it slow with him because they want to make sure he's he's good to go. But everything he's doing, he's doing at the same level, if not better, than before he got hurt. And Rodney Garner is going to have a guy come out of the blue. He's going to have a guy show up that's going to be heavier in the rotation that we haven't talked about a whole lot, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's Jason Jenkins. Yep. Somebody AP because it, it. Listen, we've covered him. You know him. I know him. There's always the one guy who, that first year, you think, ah, who is this guy? I'm not sure he can help. And then he starts to come on a little bit, and then all of a sudden, here's a guy nobody talks about that's getting 20 snaps a game as a part of the rotation. Somebody's going to emerge there. Maybe it's Joshua Josephs who did who had an okay sophomore year. Maybe it's him. Maybe it's Jason Jenkins. Somebody's going to come out of that group that we're not talking a whole lot about right now. Well, I mean, you need Josh Josephs because James Pierce is going to get so much attention. So you need Josephs or Caleb Herring or somebody. Josephs, I know, in talking to the, to the coaching staff, has had a really good offseason. It's good for him. It's good for him because, again, like you said, you need multiple uh, Leo's guys in that spot. I think the kid from Temple will be in the secondary this season, or is he just a depth player with experience? That's Jalen McMurray. Uh, Brent, the way I look at this, it, it's wide open. Yes, leader in the clubhouse, Ricky Gibson, he's been here. I think we all can agree that Jermon McCoy is going to be a player. 
Um, but but you need more than two. And I, I think that there's a lot of experience, and he's he's one of many that's going to be out there trying to prove it. I know he was getting a, an earful from Willie Martinez the other day when we were out there at practice uh, for for not hustling the way he needed to on one one specific rep. But um, I think that there's an opportunity for him. Well, uh, AP they rotated corners last year. They they played more than two corners. They they tried to they didn't play as many of the young guys as we thought, but they they did rotate some at the corner, particularly before Haddon got hurt. Um, you're right. They need more than two. Uh, who's who's corners three and four on this roster? I, I think that's I think that's an unknown right now. For me, I, I think it's pretty set who the first two are. I like Ricky Gibson and I like McCoy. Then the yeah. question is, where are they at three and four? AP. Yeah, where's Christian Conyer? Where's Jordan Matthews? Um, all of those, you know. And of course, obviously, Jalen McMurray. So, and um, to answer his question, I think McMurray plays. I, I think he. I do too. I think I he has too. a role in a rotation at corner. We'll go to NWGA Vol. Is the D-line group the healthiest position group on the football team this spring, and how important is the competition in that room to building depth behind the returning seniors uh, like James Pierce? I know we just kind of discussed it. I mean, healthiest in terms of being out there on the field, sure, it's pretty healthy, but also just the position group in general. I mean, you go three deep, three and some change. A lot of guys in that rotation who have already played, a lot of guys who are going to continue to play. Uh, always looking to compete and get better um, and, and try to help out James Pierce, who AP is going to enter the season as, as one of the, the best players in college football. Yeah, they are. They're, they're extremely healthy. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'm told that the, the, um, the morale in that room is the best it's ever been that, that, that they, that, that they're a super close tight knit unit. They're a talented unit. Obviously, Tim Banks put a lot of kind of pressure on them when he met with the media. Yeah, <laughs> on, on Tuesday. Um, but again, I, you know, I think that group can handle it because again, they're all older. You're going to have seven or eight guys that have to leave. Like they can't play anymore. So when you have that many players that have played that much football, they are, from a maturity standpoint, able to handle. I think the praise. Handle, able to handle the expectations. We're not talking about a really talented group of sophomores. We're talking about guys that are fourth, fifth, and in some cases, sixth-year players. Well, and th- th- that group probably read the quote and went, wow, somebody likes us because because the guy coached them every day, tells them how bad they are every rep. Now, he loves them. Don't get me wrong. Rodney Garner's a great – but, I mean, they're – Humble pie comes every day for that group when Rodney Garner starts talking, whether it's in the film room, whether it's, you know, during a drill, whether it's, you know, during a water break, whatever. I mean, it, it, there is constant, constant coaching through what you did wrong more than, <clears throat> hey, you did a really good job with that one. And, and that's something you have to get used to. And I think that group has handled that. And, and that group can handle it really well because they're a bunch of grown men is, is what they have there. Now, to, to me, I, I'm, I'm curious to see where Caleb Herring is. How much of a stride does he make this spring? He he flashes. What does that look like, right? Is he heavy enough? Is he strong enough? Where is he now compared to where he was a year ago? Uh, I, I think he's an X factor that I'm curious to see kind of what his role is and where he's at year two in this program. Did, did you get Rodney that, that toboggan yet? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to so I don't get beat with a cane. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I love I love him, but I mean, you know, AP. You always talk about me being being Eeyore. I mean, you can go Rodney. I mean, you, you got you got three first round draft picks. We're not very good. I mean, you know, he's not very good. This guy's not very this. I mean, you've had those conversations. You know exactly how it goes. That's just him by nature. Ah, oh, you're exactly right. <laughs> like like man, I got three sets. Price. You just see all that went into that play. I mean, you know, he, he, he gets all the credit, but <laughs> nobody's safe either. Those prospect camps in June, but I mean, it's, yeah. it's competitive and everything. And you hear somebody just screaming, you turn around, it's like, dude's like 14 years old. Dang, chill out. <laughs> nobody's nobody busts chops more than Rodney Garner, and it comes down to the simple thing. I mean, he, how many times have you seen him wear me out about wearing Peter Millar? You know, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, he's, you know, he's, you, know you got your Peter Millar on. You know. I mean, a, a, a meeting with that position group is, I'm sure, is a fascinating deal. You know, and I mean, I just think you got to do it every single day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, that's, that's, but that's what's made him great for three decades. Yeah. That's why, I mean, that's why he has guys at the NFL Hall of Fame. 
right? I mean, that's why, you know, I mean, James Pierce, you know, fought and battled through it, and look where James Pierce is now, right? I mean, it just – that that's that's the way he goes, and that's what you sign up for when you sign up to play for him. And um, those guys who handle it come out on the other side of it really, really much better football players and much better men, and they have for thirty years. We'll go next to UT Sportsman sixteen. Nate Sneed's velocity was down five to seven miles per hour on Sunday. Is that something physical, or is that him preserving energy, knowing he's going to be pitching several innings? He's obviously at his best when he's throwing usual upper 90s yeah I think that's him preserving knowing that they're gonna be counting on him to throw an extended amount of pitches extended amount of innings you know anywhere from two to four maybe five he threw six innings the weekend before I think that was him more of trying to save a little bit so he could go but obviously for him he's got to be at its best and if you're if your velocity is in the in the mid to lower 90s that, that doesn't mean that you're at your best you got to you know, maybe come up with a plan. To make, maybe six innings isn't your forte. It's Nate Snead. Again, they're trying to figure out exactly how they want to use a guy like him. And um, you know, right now it looks like he's going to pitch on Sunday. It's going to be multiple innings. And as of now, it's not going to be in a starting role, but we will see. Uh, let's go to ATL VFL. Based on observation so far, do we go after a backup quarterback this spring? Again, we've had this conversation so many times. It's tough to bring in a backup quarterback. Yes, there are outlier teams out there who have brought in multiple quarterbacks. We understand that. Brent, I think if Tennessee could get one, they would take one, uh, certainly, because of kind of where you are on the roster. I just I don't know how realistic it is, but if one wants to come, that they'll open the door, right? Yeah, but, but who's – I mean – Who's, but again, who's going to come? Who's like gonna, no one's going to come, especially a guy with multiple years. Yeah, that you're going to say, hey, he's the backup quarterback. That that you know that this guy's going to be the clear cut backup quarterback. I just, I think it's really hard to do. Um, so I, I'll be, you know, I, I'll be surprised if you see that. But I'll say this: I mean, with what we saw out of the Caden Proctor dudes this week, God only knows what's going to show up in the spring portal, right? I mean, I don't think that's going to be a common trend by any means, but. We, we're all seeing anything is possible with the transfer portal right now. And and this AP, this 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 is where coaches are, are losing their mind with the portal is the fact that you can have a guy on your campus for three and a half months and he can turn around and leave on you again. And, and that's why I believe that at some point the portal rules have to shift that wherever you transfer to, you've got to stay through a competitive season before you can transfer again. Because I think this idea that you could transfer in January – and then transfer again in late April is not is it's just maddening. I, I just don't know how you're supposed to manage that if you're a coaching staff. Just because you did Howler and Hilton Hill's show, anything is possible, doesn't mean you have to promote it on the podcast. I'm playing. Um, <laughs> Kevin no, Garnett is what I thought of. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, like it is silly, Hubber. I mean, like you. <sighs> it, it, I, I get it. Coaches can kind of come and go, but coaches don't you know, come and go after the season and do it again before the, the next season. Like, like that, that's so, and I'm not saying that there's not the rare exception, right? Like look at uh, Kamal Hatton. He went to Auburn for a spring, left, you know, and, and came to Tennessee. Um, but I, I just, I, I don't know, man. I just don't like the, the whole bouncing around and, you know, like the Creighton Proctor situation, and there's a lot of rumors out there about other guys. Um, now, will it end up coming true? A lot of rumors end up not coming true. Agreed. Agreed. Um, you know, I, I'm with you, though. I, I think something has to be done. I do think that you'll see a bunch of guys either trying to leverage, you know, which, you know, uh, because, you know, the first time around was kind of right there when that two-time transfer kind of happened, and so they didn't, they didn't have as much leverage – and now I think they'll have more leverage coming out of spring. Um, and, and coaches and schools will have to determine, you know, is it worth it, right? I mean, so I think, you know, will Tennessee lose two or three guys after spring? I'd be shocked if they don't. Um, I think a lot of schools will. Well, and, and again, I, I'm okay if guys leave after spring, right? I, I don't have a problem with that. My issue is with a guy who comes in in January and then leaves again in, in April. Because what are you supposed to I mean, are you supposed to treat those three months like it's an official visit? Every day is an official visit because you're having to recruit them all the way through for three months until you get to the second portal window closing, so they don't leave on you again. I mean, like I, I just think that this is, I, I just, I, I, it just throws up a lot of red flags for well, me. 
let's 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 play two. I mean, like in theory here, right? Like, you know, like let's say one of those offensive tackles at LSU went down in spring practice, and they knew he was going to be out for the year. There's nothing stopping Lance Hurd from going back to LSU to play offensive tackle, and all of a sudden he's a for sure starter. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Like, I, or you know, I mean, like that's where like it, it's it's it, that's where it's like okay, come on. Like I mean, like you know, you don't think that Alabama's not been sitting here, you know, talking to Caden Proctor? I mean, come on. Like, I, of course they have. Just, Just like, like Iowa was talking Iowa to him the entire the time he was time. there. Yeah. Yeah. Just like Iowa was the first time. Those guys. You know, those guys, his teammates are calling, going, hey, man, it's different down here now. Or, yeah. or it's, it's, you know, you're going to like it here. It's this. It's, you know, we get to do this that we couldn't do or what, whatever their selling point is. My point is you have to hold – you have to hold those guys – you have to hold guys somewhat accountable when they make a move. Like, you've got to stay – again, I think you've got to stay for a season. Only the fall sports are dealing with this. With 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 the with the the two windows, right? Basketball doesn't have a two window. I mean, you okay. transfer, you transfer, you're playing there, you know. Uh, and so I, I just think that we have to look at that. This got to be something that's examined better, and and um, that they got to have a better answer to. Because I don't think this, I don't think it's good for the kids to bounce around. Um, not just what it does to your team, but I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a good look for Caden Proctor, right? I mean. If I'm an NFL scout, I mean that's that's on my list of I got to have a lot of answers as to what the world was going on in that deal. I'm not saying you don't draft him, but I'm just I don't think it's a great look for guys. Is my point? Yeah, it would make a lot more sense had he started at Iowa, wanted to leave, transferred to Alabama, and got down there and said, "Yeah, I mean, I just miss home," and went back home. He went to Alabama, went back home, and now it's going back to Alabama. Like you know what I mean? Like it. it there's something that just doesn't like it doesn't smell right. And again, I don't think Alabama's doing anything wrong. No different than any other team is doing the same stuff. I think it's just a product of the environment that's been created. But don't worry, silver lining, Hawkeyes fans, according to your head football coach, Proctor didn't take a playbook with him, so no way to hurt the program. So that's a silver lining. Hey, is that is that Iowa playbook like multiple pages, or is it just like the front and back? Is it a front and back like a menu at a, a single restaurant? Seater. I mean, what what does that thing look like <laughs> after watching them in the bowl game? That that you uh, tell me it's not the uh, the cheesecake factory. <laughs> no, it's not a cheesecake factory menu. That's for sure. And and if they had the laminate Waffle House menu, they would only have like single day selections on there. It would be. It would, <laughs> It would, be, it would be a small card based on what we've seen out of that Iowa offense. Oh, All right, we'll get we'll get a couple more here. We'll go to one from Andrew Aikens. Uh, is Sham going to be a full-time guard, or will he be a Swiss Army knife, just plug and play like Cade Mays or even Dane Davis? Uh, wh- AP, it looks like Sham is going to have every opportunity to learn that he can play guard and, and, and be a guy that can compete for the left guard spot. Of, you know, he, He's been a tackle throughout his career, obviously his young career. Uh, I think it just – we'll see what he can do and see what he can prove at guard. And if he proves he can play guard, then sure, he can be kind of a Swiss Army knife. But, I mean, he's trying to be a starter on this football team this year. I think he's just a guard at this point. Uh, I don't think that he's going to be doing any much any tackle work at all. Um, in my opinion, he's going to move to guard. Do you agree, Hope? I mean, yeah. I don't think he's practicing a guard, but I think he's – Guard, but yeah. I, I think what the poster means is say he's not a starter and say a tackle goes down next year. I mean, he's a guy that can play tackle, yeah. I mean, you know, but I mean, he hasn't played tackle in a game. I mean, like, what true, we don't know that he can play tackle. I mean, Dane Davis is a Swiss Army knife because in SEC play, he's played a whole bunch of places. Sham hasn't played in SEC play, so just because he's practiced some at tackle his first year. I think that the the feeling is that the the most most productive position for him is at the guard spot, and that's where he can be at his best, and that's why I think he's going to be an exclusive guard. If Sham started at left guard, he would be the first offensive lineman that was recruited out of high school by this staff to start and really play any meaningful snaps. Like I don't count like when you go in, you're up fifty five to nothing. I mean, like real time. Everybody else has either been out of the portal, previous staff, or junior college. Yeah, I just don't. To, to answer the proposer's question, I don't think he's done enough that you could say, "Hey, he's a guy we flip around that he he can play, he can play, you know, either side guard or tackle for us." I, I don't, I don't think that that's, 
I don't think that he's proven himself to, to be a Swiss Army knife. Right now, I think he's trying to prove himself to be that he's capable of being a starter in this group on the offensive line in the SEC. And I think the most likely position for that to happen is the guard spot right now. With the rash of cleanups and precaution with the O-line starters, who do you see taking advantage of the uh, opportunities most of getting the reps this spring? Could be a candidate to start or just a, a young guy that is ahead of schedule is depth. Of course, we just talked about Sham. Anybody else that could really take advantage of the spring with, with multiple guys out? For me, AP, I, I think you got to put Aiden Bustle in that category at the guard spot because when you look at where they are at guard with with you know Spragans being out, you know what you have in Jackson Lampley, um, and, and that's that, you know that's some confidence and belief in him based on the way he played. Now it's about finding some of those young pieces, and and where's a guy like Aiden Bustle, Gage Ginther, um, you any know, young I, guys. Yeah, any of those young guys. I don't know. You know, I'd say going into spring, maybe Bicelain get some work at guard. I think you may leave him at center the entire time. Uh, so Sham, Aiden Bustle, Ginther, uh, you know, those guys, you know, jump out to me as possibilities of guys who can help you, uh, who can make the most of this spring. Jesse Perry is not going to come out of spring where you go, hey, he, he's ready to go. He's going to help us. But, I mean, that guy's going to get as many snaps as he wants, I think, this spring, which is good for him. Well, same thing with Trevor Duncan. Like, you know, he's not helping you right now. But all those guys – need to drink out of the fire hose. And I think it's good for them. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I think it's going to, you're going to have opportunity. Are you going to make mistakes? hundred percent, million percent. But like, you just hope they can continue to grow because again, again a year from now, it's Lance Hurd. And who? Yeah. I mean, so you, you say there's opportunity on the offensive line. There is opportunity. Opportunity is now here. I was told there wasn't. So I, was, I was just double checking. It's double not checking. opportunity is nowhere. Opportunity now. The question I have with Trevor Duncan is where's his buy-in to being an offensive lineman right now? I, I think it's pretty strong. I think that he, he's very content with the move. Yeah, and and because he has all the tools. I mean, there's 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 a lot to work with when you look at that frame and everything. It's just you know, right now he's everything's a bazillion miles an hour for him. Just learning lingo mm -hmm. and you know, different phrases and, and certain drills that they're doing that he's never been a part of. So this is a tough spring for him mentally. Uh, he's got to have to fight through some stuff early until he starts to get comfortable uh, with that position. That's why I wondered a little bit about his buy-in. Last one, we'll go to Sam Smith. Uh, two SEC weekends at home against two of your less good less less good opponents. What does the arm barn usage look like this weekend? Do you see freshmen get real run or do they go with older guys? They have got to force feed these freshmen. And these freshmen, I mean Matthew Dallas and Derek Shaver. Dylan Lloyd's already getting a whole lot of run. Didn't get run last weekend. Of course, it's different when you get an SEC play. But you are going to have to force feed these freshmen. I understand that you want to win games. I get all that. But then you're in a situation like you were Sunday when seemingly you go into the, uh, the rubber match um, uh, of the series and, and you feel great about you know the availability of your bullpen but you don't have a guy that you feel confidence in turning to with Gage Miller coming to the plate. Again, it's not like it's going to be automatically fixed this weekend, but you've got to get these guys some reps. And Matthew Dallas got in there for the ninth inning in the midweek. I thought that was good. You better see Derek Schaefer this weekend. I asked Tony um, if he was available, and he said, yes, he's available. He's ready to go. So, I mean, you know, I, I think you got to force feed some of these freshmen. But, I mean, they're going to throw these guys. We'll see about Marcus Phillips where he's at. Stamos is back. He's going to get a ton of run. You know they're going to throw Banky a ton, Kirby a ton, uh, so on and so forth. But I, I am looking. They have got to get these freshmen in there, and they've got to they, they, they got to see what they got in them in SEC play. Update on Dalton Bargo's hamstring. Yeah, Tony said after the game uh, on Tuesday that, uh, of course, they're going to be cautious with him and everything. And, and I was told before Tony said this, he, he, he could probably pinch hit on, on that Sunday game last weekend. He could probably pinch hit last night. He could probably pinch hit this weekend, but he's probably not going to be out running around in the outfield um, because it's just a minor hamstring strain. You don't want to ever make that worse. So look for him to maybe hit, but uh, probably a, a week or so away from or at least from being back out there and running around. Um, and so we'll see what happens there. And then finally, quick scout on uh, the Rebels. Yeah, I mean, I'll dive into it more on the, on the porch and, of course, the, the preview. Uh, they got some guys. I mean, they're a pretty decent hitting team. Ethan Ledge is, you know, 384 at the, at the plate right now. You got Andrew Fisher that's kind of the power source in that lineup. Starting pitching, 
It's pretty decent, a team ERA of 388. But at the end of the day, this is a team that's not not bad, 16-6 and six overall. But this is a team you got to beat, um, especially at home. Over the next two weekends, you really need to go 5-1, and one, in my opinion. Um, you can live with 4-2, and two, but you really need to go 5-1. and one. I think it starts with Ole Miss here. It's one of those series that if you're who you think you are, Tennessee, and you're as good as you think you are, you need to take advantage of this at home. And that starts with a series like Ole Miss. So uh, we'll dive into more of that on, on the Porch Podcast. Uh, that's all the questions we have today. Really appreciate you guys for sending those in each and every day for recruiting questions and baseball and spring practice and basketball, all that and more. We got a crossover season in full effect. Brent Hubs over at VolQuest.com. And there's a lot of people listening that might not be members of the site, but there's surely no better time to join us than right now. Yep, got the, the, the March Madness deals going on right now. It's a great time to check us out. You don't want to miss out on any of our coverage that's going on right now. Tons of recruiting stuff. Um, we, we, we had a lot of recruiting stuff on Wednesday. We'll continue to have recruiting stuff here over the course of the, the next few weeks because Tennessee's going to have a ton of prospects in. Of course, we had Jamie French update and everything else from earlier in the week as well. So um, there's this is a busy time in recruiting for Tennessee, so we got full coverage of that. Spring football, obviously, we'll cover this basketball team as long as they're playing, and, and you hope that that's multiple weekends. And then baseball settling in for the marathon, and, and this is two big home series that they have coming up uh, the next couple of weeks. We'll be covering all that and uh, talking about it all at the general's quarters. So if you're only watching this on uh, YouTube or you're only listening to this on your podcast, you're, you're only getting a snippet of what Ball Quest is really all about. So uh, jump in and be a part beyond just this. We appreciate you listening, subscribing, and being a part of our podcast family. But, but come be a, a full member of the family at BallQuest.com. We'd love to have you. And you can do it now for $1 for one month to get started, $1 for one month, and then that'll get you rolling. And, um, yeah, you'll see everything we have to offer. It's, it's an awful lot right now. Big thank you to our friends over at Exterior Home Solutions for being the presenting sponsor of this podcast, Local and Trusted, since 1999. If you need uh, renovations for your home, repairs, roofing, siding, whatever the case may be, contact Exterior Home Solutions today by calling 865-524-5888 for a free estimate or visiting them online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. For Brent Hobbs, Grant Ramey, who joined us for the first couple of minutes, Austin Price, I'm Eric Kane. Thank you, as always, for joining us here on the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast.